I have um, prepared a presentation, uh, which I will show you in a few moments. But before, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Markus. I'm from the Fan Universität in Hagen, which is uh, the only official federal distance teaching university in Germany. So we have a blended learning approach. We do most of our time online teaching our students. And I'm in the Department of Instructional Media and Technology. Uh, so we do a lot of experiments with um, educational technology. Uh, I'm teaching a master's course on educational technology. And in my research, I'm focused on open education. And my goal here this afternoon is to provide a little insight uh, or look behind the curtain. So what it's, what's behind open education from a philosophical standpoint. And so, um, and, and then I would like to engage you in a discussion. I think we can use the, the chat. So you can type in your questions or remarks, and then uh, we can discuss. Uh, I have prepared some questions, and so we can use this as guidelines, but I'm very happy to answer all your questions. Uh, let me start uh, with the agenda. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is what is open education and what it's all about. Then I would like to give you a short historical reconstruction of the moment and then some key assumptions from this movement and then a discussion of the claims um, and are there alternative interpretations. So my, my uh, scope is not only on the actual discussion on open educational resources or on massive uh, open online courses on the MOOC uh, debates, but more largely on um, the whole open education movement, which goes far back as the, act, uh, the current MOOC debate. So this is important to keep in mind. So we are talking about more of the, the, the history of open education. And so, uh, before I pre present my uh, definition, I would like to ask you, what is your understanding of open education? So, uh, what, when you think of open education, just a few comments or, or aspects, what are you thinking of when you are asked to define open education? Okay, we have education for everyone to learn everything they want at any time. Uh, and so it's kind of a right or freedom to learn what you want. Collaborative brainstorming leading to faster learning and prototopic exploration. Yeah, this is um, linked to the discussion of sharing, I think. So if you teach or learn, you should be open to share your thoughts with other to, to engage in discussion. I cannot engage in discussion without sharing. So this is, um, of course, a very important aspect and copy left know-how. Yeah. So, um, oops. I have here a definition from uh, 1974, so about, uh, around 40 years ago. And here is uh, it's said, although it's way um, before the, the internet and um, all the ICT stuff, um, but um, it's, it's more of a political or ideological uh, definition. Oh, it, it emerged at a time when people were um, not so satisfied with the 
traditional schooling system, so they wanted to open up everything, which then uh, almost immediately uh, led to massive problems uh, because nobody actually knew how to define open education. And I think this is a very important lesson to learn that um, when people were talking about open education, they had no clear idea of what, uh, how, how, in what, in what sense, open uh, education should be open. So here it says an uh, approach to education that is open to change, to new ideas, to curriculum, to scheduling, use of space to onyx expression of uh, feelings between teacher and pupil and between pupil and pupil and open to children's participation and so on. So it is a very, very broad definition. Uh, almost everything is included from um, time. So you sh um, it was said that uh, students or learners should learn at their own time so they should decide when to learn and then uh, how to they learn and uh, so where they learn so it's the um, idea to use um, the space you want and so they had a special architecture in the classroom they removed the tables and had special areas to, to study, self-study areas and these things. And also about the emotional or psychological um, aspect. So it's um, the, the honest expressions uh, of feelings, uh, but they didn't define what actually is meant with honest expressions. So um, it's, it's more of a um, set of recommendations. So how open education should be and not uh, how we define it. So I think this can clearly indicate the enormous problems with uh, open education from the very beginning because people had no idea what actually was me meant with open education. And by the same token, uh, it was, um, it, it became a buzzword because um, you you didn't know what open education was, so you could either be in favor of it or against it. So it was um, open to um, fights, uh, debates with no clear uh, evidence behind it. And also the problem was that there was no, uh, virtually no, uh, empirical data to back up or to uh, support the claims uh, of open education. So um, when people started looking at it from a scientific standpoint, there were there were no um, evidence to support um, the the arguments of the claims. So um, then uh, around the mid 70s, uh, we had a, a wave for more closed education. So um, open education became under severe criticism because of the, 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 the lack of definition and the lack of empirical support. And um, yeah, it was uh, open was just a buzzword without a clear idea of the underlying concept. So what is what, what uh, do you mean with openness or open education? And uh, as I said, you're either in favor of openness or you're against it. So it's um, a dichotomy, or black or white, or without uh, other colors. And openness is, uh, is, is in, in this sense, it's subjected to individual interpretation. And so we cannot, um, deal with it from a scientific standpoint, because in, in, in the world of research or science, science we need to um, uh, observe um, the, uh, <clears throat> the evidence and we need to interpret, or we, we need to uh, 
uh, re, uh, re repeat uh, the experiments and to, ca and to come to the same findings. So uh, if I say uh, for me open is this or that and I have observed this but I cannot uh, make it available so that other people can observe it in the same way or to uh, measure it, then I have a very big problem because then it's not a scientific discipline, it's just um, uh, a way of uh, interpreting things. And so this this um, this definition and, and the previous um, uh, reflection are based, or I'll go, go back to the 60s and 70s, and this time open education uh, emerged as an educational reform movement and, and was triggered by political and ide uh, ideological motives. So people were um, fe uh, people felt um, oppressed by the system, by the school systems. Um, there was a famous book by um, uh, Ivan Illich, uh, "Deschooling Society." Uh, which argues that the problems of the societies are the problems of the school, because the school uh, is not aimed at helping people to learn or to become educated people, but to uh, suppress them. And um, so there were some romantic conceptions of the way people should learn and uh, were heavily influenced by the philosophy of Rousseau. And uh, Rousseau, he thought that people or children are born uh, as innocent people and the society and so the schools are bad. So in order to um, help people grow up, we need to, uh, <clears throat> we need to uh, leave them uh, grow up as, as they are and to uh, not to increase the importance of school, but uh, more to um, reduce the influence of the school. So the society is the evil and the, the children has everything in it uh, to become a fully developed human being. So it's a very rom romantic conceptions. Uh, which uh, were the basis for the first uh, open education uh, concepts. So the, the open classroom movement, open schooling movements are all based on the ideas of Rousseau. And so it's to leave the children grow up on their own and to uh, reduce the influence of the teacher. And when we go uh, for uh, when we go along the history, then we come to the rebirth um, or the birth of um, open education resources um, in 2001 with the uh, MIT Open Courseware Initiative, and then uh, we have um, a new um, type of definition a new um, attempt to define open educational resources. And now it's defined as teaching, learning and res research resources that reside in the public domain or have been released under an intellectual property license that permits their free use and repurposing by others. Um, and you can see now it's more technical, the definition and more linked to the um, emerging ICT and, and the internet development because um, now we have more digital tools and so we can deal with um, materials from a digital standpoint. So the, um, the core um, of the definition is more about the techn technology and uh, the licensing and, and uh, the um, the right to uh, free use and repurpose by everybody. And we have political actors that promote the dissemination of open education resources. 
because now um, open education resources um, has become a collective uh, public good like water or air and everybody should be able to access this freely or without restrictions and um, so the, uh, the supernatural organizations like the European Union or the UNESCO they um, uh, quickly realized um, the, the, the power uh, of this concept uh, to help people learn and to uh, better the society. So they spent a lot of money to, for um, projects to um, research or to investigate, uh, investigate the power of open education resources to transform the society into the digital age and to help people become lifelong learners. Um, then um, in the years after 2001, uh, people realized that just having access to open educational resources to materials like presentations, podcasts, videos, and so on, that does not equate or does not automatically lead to education or to knowledge. So um, there was a shift towards open educational resources, uh, open education, sorry, open educational practices. That means that we need new a new culture of teaching and learning in the digital age um, a shift towards for the teachers for, uh, towards um, a new role called um, a facilitator or curator and the learner has to become a self-regulated learner so he has to fulfill much of the activities usually linked to the teacher. So you have to set your own goals, your learning goals, you have to find the materials, you have to evaluate or you, you monitor the progress and to assess your outcomes. Uh, so the, the entire process uh, of uh, learning and teaching comes together in the person of the learner. So we are looking for new ways for assessing and evaluating knowledge. Uh, and open education and resources are now, I think, uh, just um, a stone or a first step in this process because um, it gives you access to materials, but uh, to learn or to build new knowledge, you need to engage with other people talking about these things and you need to have feedback, uh, you, you should have some kind of evaluation by other persons, not only by yourself. Okay. And then another milestone in the process um, was the birth or the emergence of massive open online courses, MOOCs in 2008 by Stephen Downs and his colleagues. And now we can see um, the, the development towards open educational practices much more clearly because in the first definitions before 2008, it was, uh, it was very unclear what actually was meant with open educational practices. So what kind of practices do you mean? Uh, open teaching, open learning, what, what is this? And then with the MOOCs, I think we have a, a clearer picture of this term. And it's heavily based on the, the power or the um, open architecture of the Internet. And I think you, you are surely very well familiar with it, but I want to just briefly mention some, some key points which are that all the information is now freely available on the internet. So, um, for example, we have now seven years after the launch of uh, the MIT OpenCourseWare, 
and it um, was very successful, the Open Courseware initiative. So um, institutions from all over the world joined this initiative and opened up their materials and resources to the public. So you can really find good materials openly, unrestrictedly on the internet. And in this MOOC architecture, it's said that, yes, you can find very good and qualitatively high um, standard uh, materials on the internet. And then uh, we can build a course around it, the MOOC course, which is that we have um, a certain schedule of topics and um, along a time scale. So for several weeks, we are engaging in a discussions about the assumptions of digital technologies or learning in the future. And then we have every week, we have an um, expert who um, uh, gives a video presentation. And then during these uh, sessions, we are encouraging everybody to find materials themselves and blog about it and tweet about it. So it becomes um, a network, not just an open architecture, but also a interrelated network of resources, activities, and so on. So it's based on this um, idea of connectivism. And the most important uh, point in this MOOC thing is, in my opinion, the um, idea that you should uh, re repurpose and uh, feed forward uh, your um, materials your that you have created based on the things you've found. So for instance, if I'm looking for stuff on learning technologies, I look around the internet, do Google search and so on, and then I build an idea and write a blog post about it and Twitter uh, tweet about it. So it's that it's then the the idea that not only have I now built this idea in my mind, but I would like to invite everybody on the internet, uh, on the world, to engage in discussions about this idea. So I have to show the idea to other people, and I have to open up it and make it publicly available to other people. And this is. Uh, you can see it here on the blog uh, signs, on the, the tweet signs. So it's not like in the old days where you go to your library, find resources, write about it in a paper, and then um, hand out the paper in a, a classroom or in a seminar, and only the people that are um, inscribed or that that uh, participates in the uh, in this session in this seminar and this lecture are uh, uh, um, uh, have the chance to read your paper but now there are no restrictions so i should open up my ideas and blog uh, or uh, about it so the amount of resources increases uh, by these mooc uh, principles so what are the key assumptions of this um, open education movement, uh, which I um, define or which I try to uh, for, uh, which I try to describe in a more historical perspective? So um, it can be understood as an education reform movement to free uh, the individual from all kind of boundaries. Uh, social, economical, institutional boundaries, and uh, they are the the person. And now we can see also the emergence of a personal right to participate in the digital society. And so, um, I think the the most important thing is you should have access to the internet, and then you should um, have access to open access to materials, so without um, a paywall or some other kind of restrictions. And there are some um, political, many kind of political projects to make um, the society ready for the global competitions. So this is um, 
like the EU, uh, EU is doing um, funding projects to help other people open up their projects results and to help them find resources on the internet so to make people ready to learn in a more digital uh, sound way so um, this is the end of my initial of, of, of this um, input of this presentation and now um, I think we can talk a little bit about um, your understanding and what are in your opinion are the main advantages or disadvantages of open education or um, of uh, open educational resources or MOOCs and also maybe um, if you think that uh, open education is really conducive of a democratization of knowledge um, and what I'm also very interested in is to learn from you how do you see open education 10 years ahead so in the year 2023 will it be still around us will people still talk about open education resources or will it be uh, another term a new hype so yeah i think we can use the chat or if you have um uh yeah we, we can we can uh use the chat and please uh yeah let me hear your uh, questions and then we can talk a little bit about it There's one question, yes, um, a good one. Um, I'm concerned about the ways in which MOOCs are being co-opted by for-profit forces. I think you are referring to Coursera and Audacity um, and wondering how we push for openness. I think this is um, uh, a very, very important and major goal of this um, discussion. And I'm currently involved also in a discussion to come up with a kind of a paper to define or to claim for the openness. And um, I think we should help other people to understand the, that the most important thing is not cost free, but it's open. So if without the uh, openness, there is no possibility for me to share and repurpose and revise the materials and yeah it's very um tricky because um because um the the providers the commercial providers they um uh try to define their own way their own understanding of openness and which is not um related to the to my understanding of openness, which is um, according to David Riley, the four R principles, so the right to reuse, revise, repurpose, and so on. And I think everybody uh, who is interested in the true open education movement should raise uh, his or her, or her voice and um, stand up in favor of openness that is uh, you should you should um, uh, say or should clearly say that no this is not an open educational resource what you are providing here on the internet because I'm not allowed to do this or that and and then you shouldn't be label it as an open educational resource so it's an open call for everybody to engage in this discussion and 
Um, yeah, the, the more people know about it, um, the better it is for the entire movement. So we should not um, leave the field or the, the playground for commercial players. We should raise our voice and um, argue and say our opinion why we think it's important. Uh, yes, and MOOCs are being, yeah, the, the danger is that uh, education becomes commodified or com commercialized by these um, providers like Coursera and Audacity. And I'm also concerned about this because I think there are um, some moral implications in it which are not dealt with currently. So when you try, when, when you begin to sell a good like education, then you come to a new field and you, you um, need to uh, respond to moral um, questions um, which emerge out of it. And the, the providers are currently only pointing out to the advantages, the, the, the availability of open education for everybody without um, uh, making clear that um, this is a um, business model and we want to find ways for revenue to, uh, to, to back up our investments and this stuff. So it's, yeah, it's a crucial development and um, the, the providers, in my view, they are blinding the particip participants and uh, by neglecting these moral implications or the um, true definitions of uh, openness. Uh, I would like to hear your opinion and ideas on the claim that what in this webinar's description is. Is uh, okay. Is open education a form of uh, social exclusion? Yes, I'm happy to answer uh, answer this question. Yeah, um, I have um, uh, developed the idea based on the philosophy of Michel Foucault, the French um, philosopher, that um, on the one side or on the one hand, open education is a great thing because it opens up um, materials, access, and so on, and uh, it increases the uh, possibility for people to engage in education and in learning, but it's not a guarantee and uh, not um, uh, automatically. Uh, because when you look at the MOOC architecture, then it's a very special form of engaging and learning, and it's, it needs very, very special um, and new uh, um, competencies. So not everybody from the street or around us, if you ask your neighbor, have you ever studied a MOOC? Um, yeah, I think the answer will probably be no. That means we need, first, we need to find ways of teaching these competencies. And we shouldn't forget that MOOC is, uh, is also a kind of exclusion because people who are not willing for whatever reasons, to share their ideas and to open up their materials, they are excluded. They are not belonging to the club. And so this is really a, a kind of exclusion, in my opinion. And uh, so um, we, we should be more concerned about these people or about these mechanisms of um, exclusion, because um, the um, the first MOOCs, they were really, um, uh, really radically open, the, the, the Downs uh, C MOOCs. Then we had a shift towards more closed MOOCs, like the X MOOCs and the commercial providers um, from Coursera and Audacity. And this is the tricky point, because I think, in my opinion, the C MOOCs, they have the greatest educational potential of all MOOCs, but at the same time, they require the 
most new or the, 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 um, uh, the, the, the most forms of competencies. So they are um, demanding new skills. So um, it's not an automatically thing that you can say, okay, here I, have, I will provide a MOOC for my students in the schools and they all will be happy to learn with it. No, I think that cannot, cannot be really um, planned and, uh, or thought of. On the other hand, we need more, uh, more carefully designed um, trainings to help people engage in MOOCs. And at the same time, we should be concerned with the people that are not willing, as I said, uh, that are not willing to share their ideas. And we, we shouldn't be um, exclude them by not um, participating with them or by uh, stigmatizing them as non-openers. Uh, because this would go back to the old days uh, in the 60s or 70s. There were only two parties, black and white, so they're, they're in favor and the, 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 the um, opener, the, the club of openness and the club of closeness. And I think this is a very yeah, silly uh, or not a, not a good um, form of discussion. So we should, um, we should uh, take those people seriously and uh, try to find out their reasons of not uh, wanting to engage with MOOCs in the way we would like them to be. So this kind of exclusion uh, can all uh, can can also be seen in the ways uh, w uh, the MOOCs are currently designed, because in my view this is also a kind of elite um, organization. Because uh, once you uh, have topics like education technologies and so on and the digital society. So you have very technical um, topics, then automatically you, you will all um, only invite people engage in this kind of discussion and they are always the same people. So if you look back at the MOOCs, uh, um, in, in my country, in Germany, for example, we have, uh, we have uh, three MOOCs um, starting in 2011 and they are basically always around the same topics and you can see always the same people in it. And I think this is not a good thing because why don't we open up the topics? And why, why, um, why only do we duplicate or repeat the MOOC in the, in the same format? So um, this kind of topic orientation undermines the true potential of the MOOC, which is um, we, which we need to find out in more open ways. Okay. Okay. Here have I one over did democratize knowledge, but does it mean knowledge matters? It's only the proof of knowledge that would help equity. Okay, um, what in my opinion is also very important to understand that in this MOOC architecture there is only information available and not knowledge because I think knowledge is built in your mind, in your head, in your brain and not in the internet. Then this is also why it's important um, not to overestimate the power of Google and Google search, because Google gives you only access to information, but not to knowledge. You need to build the knowledge by yourself based on the resources. And so, yeah, it's better to have open access to resources like research papers. Or oh, I'm very, I'm, I'm a big fan of open access, and I'm try. I'm trying to publish only in open access journals because I want uh, other people to read uh, the papers. But then 
what, in this process of reading the papers, their knowledge emerge and not in the internet. So um, we shouldn't, um, like I said, overestimate the um, power of the MOOC or the, the connectivist, uh, connectivist approach um, because it's only information. But it's a very important thing that you have open access to resources and materials. But knowledge from an educational or psycholo psychological standpoint uh, is built or developed in your brain, in your mind, and not on the internet. And in this process, it's also very important to have social engagement, uh, like here in this webinar, uh, to have discussions and criticism of your kind of understanding the, the world. And so I think um, the MOOCs are very helpful for certain purposes, but they cannot, they cannot replace education uh, as, an, as an entity or as a social process, because education is about engaging in face-to-face -face, uh, social interactions and not only to have access to lectures, videos, podcasts, and so on. Okay, you have. I think we have come down from the tree, but we are still living in a cave. Yeah, uh, I'm sure that we will explode in a positive way. It may be just a chance, but I've listened to much talk about free books, but I see it more like to a possibility to make very good lessons with multimedia, and the books are just a part of it important part but we need to make the multi and what other non media with certain tools yeah this is also an important point and um, it goes back to what I was saying that uh, what matters is, is uh, I think the interaction between teacher student and material and the instructional approach to it, because I think you can have a great lecture uh, in front of 100 people and you can have a great seminar with 10 people, but there are different purposes. And so we need to carefully think, or, um, think about the purpose of instruction or of education. And then we can decide what kind of material we need and what kind of engagement with we need and I think in in, in this um, in this uh, regard it's also important to think more critically about the massiveness of the MOOC so the the M so it is all um, it's uh, it is really uh, always important to have masses to have mass education uh, so why are uh, why are those people so concerned with the masses? So they want to have 100,000 and more people in their artificial intelligence course. But for what reasons? Just to um, go to the Guinness Book of Records. Uh, so I think they're, they are, it's, it's very, very critical to think about the massiveness and the, the, the limit uh, ness, uh, the limitations of massiveness. So, if is there a, um, a limit or a cut in the massiveness? So, um, and then we can't. Um, so, because in this thinking of for for more students and more and more, uh, we try we 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 neglect neglect the um, other side. So the the not so massive uh, kind of instruction. So the Workshops, the seminars, face-to-face uh, -face, uh, uh, interactions in 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 uh, word, uh, in present uh, in in, in uh, lecture rooms and so on. So why don't we always want to reach massive co uh, causes? Okay. 
is to enter topic orientation without opening up mobility from which they are known. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, there the are a topic orientation point. Yeah, it's um I would encourage um other people to find uh topics um uh not so related to the ICT stuff but uh to topics uh, that are needed uh from a standpoint for 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 education for the person. So if you look at um for example at my university uh, many students have problems with um, research methods, so they don't know how to come up with a hypothesis, how to find literature, how to use a database and so on. So our idea is to have a MOOC dealing with scientific knowledge or scientific uh, competences. Do you have other questions? Are there any remaining open questions? Yes. Yeah. This is not a question, but I like to your opinion. Yeah, I think you have a great point uh, in this um, statement. So um, the um, the massiveness and the the, um, the setting of you have one um, excellent um, researcher, excellent teacher, and uh, he is uh, teaching in Harvard or Stanford and Princeton. So everybody. Around the world uh, would like to study with him or her, and I think this, um, yeah, should uh, sh is is triggered by by um, a narrative that goes um, on the uh, that that goes um, from the rationale of economics that you have to maximize your profits and you it's better to study by a professor from an Ivy League college than by a professor from a not so well known institute. But this undermines the philosophy or the understanding of teaching and interacting and 
um, learning because if you look at Harvard and Stanford and Yale and these institutions, they are known or they have a very, very high reputation because they produce excellent research. And so what about the quality of teaching? In this regard, we do not know so much about it because teaching does not matter so much than research because you need in order to become a professor you need to publish scientific work in um, uh, journals with high impact so you need to spend much time in, in preparing your research papers and this is to the detriment of learning uh, preparing your teaching courses and you know, if we think um, along the line of the MOOC hype, which is currently around us, then uh, many, many institutions, uh, for example, in the, in the US, uh, will face uh, traumatic problems because nobody would like to study at these institutions if they have the chance to study with Yale, Harvard and Stanford professors online on Coursera or Audacity. And so the process is in this direction because California legislation has proved, uh, approved that uh, students at certain universities can study a MOOC online at Coursera and get credit for it. So why don't, why, why do I have to go to this um, not so well known university anymore? Uh, if I can get a degree from Howard. So this is really going into a direction um, you know, which uh, follows uh, economic um, logic. And as we see with this um, globalization and neoliberalism around us in the um, uh, media sector or in other automobile uh, industry, uh, we can see uh, what consequences are around or well, we will, will follow this. And I think um, the, um, for example, the peer-to-peer -peer university is um, a great concept uh, which uh, highlights the uh, power of peer teaching, peer learning. Uh, but I think we shouldn't overestimate um, the, the, the possibilities. Because I, I really think that we, we, sh we need experts to get feedback and to um, evaluate our staff. Because the peer-to-peer the -peer or the, the peer learning, peer te teaching has limits. But I'm not saying that we only, we only should accept experts from Ivy League colleges. I think there are much more experts around us and from who are working at universities not so well known and can help uh, us to learn and to study topics. So uh, do you have more questions or comments for me? I really enjoyed this um, conversation and I thank you very much for your interest and uh, I hope we can continue with this discussion. Um, I'm on Twitter. Um, I posted my Twitter name, oh, it's M Diamond, so you can find me on Twitter and um, I would be, 
I would be happy um, to continue this conversation. So, with this being said, um, now at three o'clock we we spent one hour. I think the, the the webinar was scheduled for two hours, but I think given the the participants and so um, we can come to the end of this webinar during the Open Education Week. Uh, sure, my email. And and this is my blog. Um, I'm blogging in German and in English. So don't worry if there if you find some German uh, postings, but I'm uh, try to post um, also in. English, but I'm also involved in this German open education movement, so yeah, I have to post in German um, so that other people can understand it. Okay, then now it's three o'clock. Thank you again very much for this. In, uh, for this um, discussion, which I enjoyed very much, and um, let's keep in touch. Thank you. Bye bye.